Take your Bible this morning to the book of Isaiah, chapter 9. Isaiah, chapter 9. Again, we'll read verses 6 and 7 together as we have this month of December. And uh, as our custom usually is, let's stand together to read the scripture, all of us standing to read God's word. Let's read in unison together, verses 6 and 7 of Isaiah chapter 9. Ready? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing now again to the reading of our scripture this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful music today. It has certainly been a blessing to our hearts. I pray it's been an encouragement to your heart today as your people have sung praises to you. And Father, we're asking you now that you'll bless the special, that you will turn our eyes upon Jesus, and we'll look full in his wonderful face. And Lord, I pray that he would fill our mind and our thoughts and our hearts for these next few moments we have together. And I pray that you will minister to each one of us as only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. Bethlehem Calvary, all of a tell. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Mountain and plain with his praises shall swell. Oh, what a Savior is mine. There on the cross where he died for my sin. Oh, what a Savior is mine, giving his life a poor wonder to win. Oh, what a Savior is mine, oh, what a Savior, oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior is mine unto the uttermost, wondrous, glorious. Oh, what a Savior is mine, rising again in his infinite grace. Oh, what a Savior is mine, shedding upon me the light of his face. Oh, what a Savior is mine, lifting my burdens, relieving my care. Oh, what a Savior is mine, giving me courage to do and to dare. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Unto the uttermost wondrous glorious. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Amen. Father, we bow before you in prayer now as we open up your word and 
look once again at this wonderful prophecy that Isaiah gave us. That unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. That God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Once again, we turn our thoughts today to the names that you said He would be called. Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Minister to us today once again. Holy Spirit of God, move amongst us this morning. Stop at every occupied seat. Minister the Word of God to the people in this room today. Minister the Word of God to the people listening by way of live stream this morning. May your will be accomplished in these next few minutes that we spend together. And we'll give you the praise and the glory for it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the next title in the promise here that God gave Isaiah is he'll be called the Everlasting Father. We'll talk a little bit about the father relationship, but he's not talking to a family here. He's talking to a nation. And he's writing to the nation of Israel. When a nation calls somebody a father, it's a title of honor. The highest honor that a nation can bestow upon one of her sons, so to speak, is to name him the father of his country. And that's, that's a title given to heroes that goes all the way back to Rome in the Roman Empire. When a Roman citizen had done some brave, beautiful deed of infinite value, something of noble self-denial, while soldiers raised their shields to him, maidens would throw garlands at his feet. The populace would hail him with their shouts as father of his country. I would say what it is in Latin, but I'd butcher it for sure. Here in America, we have the father of our country, George Washington. In fact, those men who signed the Declaration of Independence, many of them, we call them our founding fathers. It's meant to honor them for the courage and the sacrifice that they displayed to enable our country to even to exist. But here, he didn't just say that Jesus would be called the Father. He said he'll be called the Everlasting Father. In other words, he'll not just accomplish something for a short period of time that we'll remember and we'll give him honor, but that he's going to, he's going to accomplish something that will be good for all time, for everlasting. That the son that was given will be a part of our lives and a gift that we'll be able to celebrate forever. The fourth name, the ever lasting father now I've never had a difficulty calling God my father but I had a good father I had a father who was a good example to me and loved me he was a, a good Christian man taught, taught us to be faithful to the Lord as you may have heard me say we grew up uh, going to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night any other night the church was open and uh, took our turn as a family cleaning the church. Uh, we were there. Any special services? said, so listen, I don't, I don't, you forgive me if I don't buy into the fact you say, well, I don't go to church. I was forced to go when I was younger. Uh, I was forced to go when I was younger too and now I still go every day of the week by my choice. And by the way, it doesn't hurt. And, and those who say that always say this, uh, listen, uh, most of those folks who say, I don't go, I was, it was forced on me when I was a kid, so I don't go now. They probably forced you to brush your teeth too. I hope you still do that. They probably forced you to bathe, and I sure hope you still do that. You see, they, they force you to do other things, and you still do it. No, you don't, you're not going to church because your heart's wicked. 
and you don't want to go and learn what God, how God wants you to live. I mean, not being mean to you, just being honest with you. So I don't have any problem calling God my Father. But understand, that's not true of every father or every parent in our generation. There's such a rampant increase of child abuse among parents. Fathers and mothers too, you can't leave that out. I don't quite understand how any parent could physically or any other way harm their child. But we read about it almost every week. But I think about the passage where the Bible says in the end days that the the love of many will wax cold and how people will be without natural affection. We kind of always take that into the term of being uh, not not men with women or women with men, but the other way around. And, And that certainly is an abomination in the sight of God. But, but don't forget, unnatural affection can be where a parent doesn't love their child and doesn't want to care for their child. That's not natural. And so I understand some have a difficult time relating to the Messiah, <clears throat> relating to the Lord as their everlasting Father because human parents can hurt us and disappoint us. But I, I want to tell you that you can always depend on your everlasting Father. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. I know your earthly father may disappoint you and your earthly father may hurt you, but I'll guarantee you your everlasting father never will. He never will. David said in the Psalms, If my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will take me up. On Friday, out at Madison, correctional facility we had a man stand up and testify brother gary he stood up he gary said i i grew up with two fathers and never really knew which one was my true father but after being born again in november of 2017 and he got born again at crc because of the ru program he said i know who my father is exactly what he said I about did a lap around the room it's wonderful to hear those testimonies now you say preacher I'm a little bit confused this is a prophecy about Jesus he's the Messiah and yet he's called everlasting father does that name apply to God the father or does it apply to God the Son. Well, there's a couple of things I want to remind you of. John 10 and verse 30, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. It's just one of the hundreds of names given to the Lord Jesus in the Bible. But it's a declaration of how He loves us and protects us and cares for us as His children. You say, how can a child be a father? How can a, how can a newborn babe be called everlasting? How does that work? Well, as we said in Sunday school this morning, and what I remind you is, Jesus Christ did not come into existence in Bethlehem. You think, wow, well, Jesus was... By, by the way, Jesus was not created by God. Did you get that? Jesus was not created by God. In the beginning was the Word. That's Jesus. He was with God and He was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He always has been. He's the eternal Son of God. What happened to Bethlehem? He, a body, He prepared it. And he came and took into the body of that little baby. In Jesus, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God, Jesus, is eternal. Eternal means they have no beginning and they have no ending. You say, well, where did God come from? God always has been. In the beginning, who was already there? God. 
He was already there when it began. Well, what was before the beginning? God. He was there. Okay? And so was the Lord Jesus. Turn over to the New Testament with me, will you please, to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Help you understand what we're talking about here. Jesus is having a discussion here with the religious leaders. They're questioning His authority. Look at verse number 48 of John chapter 8. Then answered the Jews and said unto Him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? And Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my Father, and you do dishonor me. And I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. <laughs> then the Jews said unto him, Now we know thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It's my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I, will, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him, and keep his saying. Now watch verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So are you are you kidding me? They're saying you're you're telling me that now remember now, understand where they are. They're looking at Jesus, 30, 31, 32 years of age, and he's telling them, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it. What? You're telling us you know Abraham? Notice what he said. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and thou hast seen Abraham? What are you talking about? And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, what church? I am. I am. Jesus is saying, wait a minute. I, I knew all about Abraham. In fact, I didn't just know about Abraham. I knew Abraham. And I know him. And, and he says, you're not even 50 years old. That, that's interesting to me because Jesus is in his early 30s here and they're thinking he's, he, he's at least under 50. Think he had a rough life? Hmm? I tell you the truth, before Abraham was, I am. Does that sound familiar? When Moses was called to go back to deliver the children of Israel, and he said, they're not going to believe me. They didn't believe me before, and I, I kind of blew it the first time. Uh, how are they going to believe me this time? Who am I going to tell them sent me? And what did God say? You tell them, I am has sent you unto them. God is the great I am. And that's, that's the most accurate statement you can make about God. He's the I am. He's not the was. He's not the will be. He's the I am. God is always in the present. God is always uh, in, in that in that existence. He simply is. He's everywhere at all times. He always has been. He always will be. He's the I Am. So the Bible says here that Jesus will be the everlasting Father. You know, as wonderful of a father as I had, and the wonderful times, especially, you know, like most, most children, I guess, I appreciated my father much more when I became a father. And as I grew up and grew older, I appreciated him so much more than what I did when I was younger. And yet, in May of 2007, I got the phone call from my mom that my dad had passed away. He's not the everlasting father. He's just my father. A good father. 
and a blessing to me as a father, but he didn't live, he didn't live here on earth forever. They're human. He's human. However, this Jesus, this son that is given, will be everlasting a father to you and me. Your relationship with Jesus Christ will never have an end. It, it is for eternity. It is for everlasting. It's everlasting life. Now let me give you several thoughts this morning about Jesus Christ being our everlasting Father. Number one, a father is the source of life. When a husband and wife conceive a child, a miracle occurs. The giver of life is God. That's why, that's why abortion is murder. We're taking the place of God. That is, God gives life. The Bible says the fruit of the, fruit of the womb, I always have to be careful on say fruit of the loom there, but uh, <laughs> fruit of the womb is His reward. That's His reward. God gives that because the Bible here then is, is, is telling us, listen, who's the everlasting Father here in Isaiah 9, 6? It's Jesus Christ. Who is the source of life? Jesus Christ. God's letting us know that His Son will be the source of life. He's the agent through which spiritual life is given. Jesus would come on the scene and say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. There's no life apart from Jesus Christ. In fact, in the book of Timothy, when it talks about some of the women that were living in pleasure, they say, well, they that live in pleasure are dead while they live. Say, so, well, you know, life begins at 40. No, it doesn't. Life begins when you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's when life begins. He is the source of life. There's a lot of talk in our country about illegal immigration. An illegal Immigrant is somebody who enters our country without the proper credentials. In other words, they're here without permission. When you have the proper credentials and the proper permission, you have nothing to fear. Without that permission, without those credentials, you live in uncertainty and in some cases you live with some fear. But the same is true with our spiritual life. You try to get into heaven without the proper credentials. You don't get in. What's the proper credentials? A good life? No. Go to church? No. Go to a Baptist church? No. Huh? Know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Bingo. You got it right there. You get in. That's the proper credentials. The Bible says over in the book of Ephesians, Paul told those folks, we before Christ... Without Christ, we're aliens and we're, we're strangers from the covenant of promise. It says we have, we're without hope and without God in the world. So it's only through Jesus Christ. Somebody says, well, preacher, I think I'm a pretty good person. How good is good? How good is good? I probably, no matter how good you are, I can probably find somebody that's better than you. So you start claiming your own goodness to try to get into heaven and someone else is going to step up and one-up you. You're, 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 you're done. Doesn't work that way. It's not religion. It's not your good works. It's not anything we do. It's what's been done for us by Jesus Christ and faith in Him. Only the Father gives life. We talked about in Sunday school, that's why the, the virgin had to conceive. Because in Adam, all die. For as by one man's sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. How does that curse of sin and the, and the curse of the sin nature, how does that come to all of us? It comes through the Father. The Father gives the seed. And you understand and, and so all of us, with an earthly father, we're born sinners. What, what does a person have to do 
to die and be separated from God and be punished in hell for their sins? Absolutely nothing. Just live and do what you want and die and neglect Jesus Christ. Most of you know John 3.16. Turn there with me, will you? John 3.16. You're just a few chapters away from it if you're still in John 8. Most of you could probably quote John 3.16 to me. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. But most people could never tell you what comes after John 3.16. But look with me at verse 17. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Now, it means He didn't send Jesus in to condemn the world. Why not? Because of verse 18. Look at verse 18. He that believeth on Him is not, what church? Condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So, if I don't believe in Jesus, if I never do trust Him as my Savior, then I am condemned already. So he says, ah, that's saved business. I mean, that's saved business. What are you talking about? Hmm? Hey, you can believe that if you want. But you're condemned already. Because you have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. If you don't need to be saved, why did God send a Savior? Why did He say unto you, is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. My friend, if He sent a Savior, somebody needed to be saved. And that was us. We needed a Savior. God sent Him. The Father gives life. Secondly, the second thought I want to give you this morning is a father is someone with whom you share a relationship. See, the word father is a relational word. You don't use the word father just to describe anybody. It's someone with whom you have a relationship. It's a relationship in which you know their name. You share companionship. Your needs are met. You share love one with another. And that was, Jesus was God's way of expressing His love to us. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. It was His way of showing us how much He loves us. But I understand this, a relationship has to have two people in it. A relationship has to have two people. One person doesn't make a relationship. So God has extended to us to have a relationship with Him. But the only way to do that is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Do you have that relationship with God? Do you, do you, do you talk to Him? Do you spend time with Him? Do you listen for Him to speak to your heart? How's your relationship with the everlasting Father? You remember in Adam and Eve in the garden? Well, you don't remember them, but you remember reading about them. And... When God called to Adam and they were hiding from God, what did God come down to do? Yeah, to take a walk with them. And, and it, it, you, you gather from that reading that this is not the first time that happened. God would come down and walk with Adam and Eve. Can you imagine that? This time they're hiding from God. By the way, sin will do that. Sin will make you hide out from God. It'll, 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 it'll sever that fellowship you have with God. And now, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save 
that which was lost, that fellowship that was lost when Adam and Eve sinned against God. You're not saved just so you don't go to hell. That's a wonderful benefit. But you're not fulfilling the purpose for which God saves you if that's all you say. Hey, I, yeah, I, hey, I, I walked out when I was 12. I got saved. I'm good. And you don't talk to God. And you don't read His Word. And you don't care about the things of God. Don't fool yourself. Don't deceive yourself. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you just know about Him? Or do you know Him? When He's the everlasting Father, it means you have a relationship with Him. And God has designed that we have a relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ. A father gives life. A father gives relationship. We share a relationship. Number three, a father provides. In fact, sometimes in the home, the father is referred to as the breadwinner. Right? Bring home the... Boy, bacon sounds good right about that. <laughs> the trouble is, the, the concept that with our with our proud spirit that we carry. We don't like it when somebody just provides things for us. By the way, that's one of the sad things that's happened in our country. You know, I don't know what would happen. I don't know what will happen. I think the day will come when we'll go through something similar to what this country called the Great Depression. But even the poor in those days who had nothing, they would knock on your door and ask if they could do something or work something for a sandwich. They didn't want a handout. They wanted to work to earn something. I'm not sure we'd be there if that happened today. I think they'd be coming in your house to take whatever you got. There's something in us if you have some character in you that, that you don't just want handouts. Because you know what it does? It reminds us that we're very dependent on somebody else. There's an ingrained element in our human spirit that just kind of fights against being dependent. But that's really part of our sin nature. Because what happens is people who listen to that that's, they use that as a reason not to have God in their life. You ever had somebody tell you, well, you want to believe in God, if you need that crutch, you go ahead and use it. What are they saying? I don't need anybody. I can, I can do my own stuff. How many of you know, how many of you know, God can put you flat on your back, just like that. And you wouldn't be able to do anything. Some of you it's happened to. You know that I, I sometimes I, I used to take I used to take kind of with a grain of salt. Uh, you have testimonies and you know prisoners, especially in prison. They you raise their hand, I say, Yeah, and they say, Well, I just want to thank the Lord for waking me up today. And I used to think, sir. But you know, Brother Chuck? Chuck's sister in law, his brother's wife. This past week, he woke up. She didn't. Laying beside him in bed, she's gone. 60 years old. Nothing wrong. Nothing that they knew of, anyway. They just had, were together the night before, had a normal night. Everything seemed fine. I guess, you know, when, when you told me that the other night, I thought, maybe I shouldn't think so lightly of I thank the Lord for waking me up today. Maybe a pretty good thing. You see, we are dependent. And one of the things you have to learn as a Christian is we are completely dependent upon Him. We're completely dependent upon Jesus Christ. We, we think we can do it without Him. 
And if you're not careful, we think we can even live the Christian life without Him. I know how to carry my Bible. I know how to go to church. I know how to say amen to everybody and look pious and sound good. And no one will know anything that I'm not even close to God. I don't even talk to Him. But Jesus Christ said, Without me ye can do nothing. Oh, you may step back and say, look what I did and look at the song I sang, look at the class I built, look at the house I have, look at the cars I drive, look at what I've done. And you know what? When it comes to the judgment, the Lord will put a match to it all and it will burn up in an instant. And you'll have nothing. Because without Christ, we can do nothing. Christian. C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N. You take Christ out of that, all you have is I-A-N, and that stands for I am nothing without Christ. Don't forget that. He provides for us. Without Him, we're nothing. He provides wisdom. He provides direction for our life. You know, it's... just as sure as you set out on a trip. Nowadays, hardly anybody carries maps because you got that GPS in your phone. You got that person in there that talks to you and sometimes tells you the wrong way to go, but you, you trust that thing. Some of you have learned that sometimes if you do anything local, it'll tell you to go a certain way, and you're thinking, what are you telling me to go that way for? I know a better way to go than that. And, and then they're always recalculating or, you know, whatever, and you're driving them nuts probably. But you know what? God has given us a book to give us direction. Direction. And all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Let let the everlasting Father provide for you. He provides everything for us. He will take care of us. A father gives life. A father shares relationships. A father provides. A father is an encourager. A father's an encourager. We all need encouragement and affirmation. A sports columnist named Bob Green once asked Michael Jordan why he liked his father to be in the stands during a game. And Michael Jordan said, when he's there, I know I have at least one fan. Dr. John Trent, who's a Christian psychologist, said several years ago while he was speaking at a conference, a lady shared this this story with him. It involved her son. The lady's son developed the custom of taking his daughters out for a date night. And on one occasion, he took his two-year-old daughter out for a date. He took her out for breakfast. After receiving their breakfast and before eating, The young father decided to spend time affirming his daughter. He told his little girl how he prayed for her and how she was wonderful and how obedient she was and how pleased they were that God gave her to them. And after sharing these things with her, the food came. And the father picked his fork up to eat, but before he could do that, the two-year-old laid her hand over on his and said, Longer, Daddy. Longer. What she wanted was, keep talking, Daddy. Keep talking. She liked what she was hearing. A few days later, that little girl ran up to her mom and said, I'm a really special daughter, Mommy. Daddy told me so. Daddy told me so. You know what he's saying? He's saying this Son that is given will be the everlasting Father to encourage you. He is the encourager. 
That's what fathers are supposed to do. We're to encourage our children. If God be for us, who can be against us? If any of you played sports, and what was you, I'm sure it was way with you, Brother Dave. Your biggest, your biggest fan was your dad. Now, he's your biggest critic, too, in my case, too. You know what I mean? It's all things I should have done, you know, uh, where I should have dribbled the ball and shot the ball and all that. But, you know, always an encourager. I remember pitching baseball. And hot, they called it hot stove league back then, 15, 16-year-old. And my, my dad would stand behind the backstop. They probably wouldn't let you do this anymore, you know. This was back in the old days, and, uh, though I'm not that old. And um, he would sit there and say, what's, he'd talk to the batter while I'm pitching. Brother Tom, he'd say, what's coming next? It's going to be a fastball? going to be a curveball? What's it going to be? He'd talk to the batter that way. That guy wouldn't know what was coming. Huh? But that is, you don't think that was an encouragement to a 15 and 16-year-old young man? It absolutely was. That's what, listen, that's what fathers do. Can I, can I help you to understand? Somebody says, oh, you know, I better go here. You know, God will be mad at me or God's going to hit me over the head. Why do you think God's mad at you all the time? Why do you think that, that you're always in trouble? Hmm? He, he's there to encourage you. He's pulling for you. If God be for us, hmm? He's for us. He, he wants us. And, and he's, as the everlasting father, our encourager. And then let me give you number five. A father gives security and protection. The parent always represents security for the child. But where do we get our security? It's not from the government. It's from God. There's great security. Jesus Christ is our security. He's our security. As the everlasting Father, He gives us security. When I got that phone call that my dad was gone, I had the security of knowing where He was. Absent from the body and present with the Lord. I have that security. That's why the psalmist would write, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why not? For thou art with me. He says, I don't have any fears because of who I'm with. Some says, you fear dying. No. Because I know who's with me. There's no fear there. I trust Him. Jesus Christ can give you the security of eternal life. Jesus said this, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And my Father which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Oh, there's security there. One preacher wrote about telling, talking to a new convert who came in deep distress to see him, and he said this, No matter how much I pray, no matter how hard I try, I simply cannot seem to be faithful to the Lord. I think I'm losing my salvation. And the pastor replied, Do you see this dog here? He said, Yes, he's my dog. He's house trained. He never makes a mess. He's obedient. He's a pure delight to me. He said, now, out in the kitchen, I have a son, a baby son. He makes a mess. He throws his food around. He soils his clothes. He's a mess. But you know who's going to inherit everything I have? Not that dog. That son. He's the heir of everything I have. 
Listen to me. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you are an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Not because you don't make a mess. Not because you don't do things you shouldn't do. But because you were born into the family of God by faith in Jesus Christ. You're an heir. You're in the will. You're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. That's security. That's security. Jesus gives us security about dying. He gives us security about fear. He gives us security about our soul. He gives us security about eternal life. He's the everlasting Father. He gives life. He provides relationship. He provides for us wisdom and direction and provision for each of us. He encourages us and He gives us security and He gives us protection. What a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior is mine unto the uttermost wonderful glorious oh what a savior is mine thank you lord for being wonderful counselor the mighty god and the everlasting Father. Lord, we love you this morning. My prayer is twofold today, God. I pray that if anyone in this room has never received Jesus Christ, the giver of life, that they would receive Him as their Savior today. That their faith would be built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness that they would not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. That they would trust the one who is the only one who can give them eternal life by placing their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And I pray, Lord, that others in this room who know Him as Savior would realize He's also an everlasting Father. And they would desire to have a close relationship with Him. That they would look to Him to provide the needs of their life. That they realize I can be dependent on Him. As a Father, He'll care for His children. But Lord, He protects us and gives us security. He encourages us. Thank you. Thank you for being an everlasting father to me.